Um, I'd like to just uh, take the opportunity to thank Angus Australia and all the sponsors for uh, putting the conference together and certainly the land for uh, sponsoring this session. Um, today uh, I've been asked to present some information on managing the high fertility herd and uh, part of that I wanted to look into what some of the risks were of, of having a high fertility herd. So uh, we, there's often a lot of conversation about some of the benefits and I just wanted to have a look at some of the realities about how we how we manage it. So uh, before I get into my uh, presentation, I've just got, we've had a short video prepared just describing uh, who we are and what we do and, and giving a bit of background as to why we're here. So I'll just uh, play that. Your farm, your livestock, your future. We understand how important the integration of these elements are to your business. Our priority is working with you, combining expert veterinary service with state-of-the-art equipment, knowledge and advice to help you make better decisions and become more profitable. We are a large and professional collaborative team, providing personalised services and support to livestock producers across Australia. Our involvement in industry research and development assists your livestock business to stay at the cutting edge of beef production and reproduction. We specialise in beef production. Our services include bull fertility testing, pregnancy diagnosis, artificial insemination and embryo transfer, and a range of other services from disease prevention programs and nutritional advice to strategic management and breeding programs. HVC has a purpose-built donor centre based at Water Park Holbrook, which provides comprehensive embryo production services for small or large groups of donor cows. We also have a large recipient herd which allows us to provide ET calf raising services. Our head office in Holbrook is the headquarters for all our specialists, where our highly trained and dedicated support staff are well equipped with state-of-the-art facilities and systems to help deliver high quality services. So if livestock is your livelihood, come to the production and breeding specialists. HVC, your partners in production. I suppose a little bit tricky, uh, uh, cheeky I should say, to have some uh, Herefords and Shorthorns at an Angus conference, but uh, it was a bit hard to cut them out. So um, today I just want to have a chat about <coughs> what fertility is and, and how we define it. And we've got a slightly different definition to some people, so uh, we'll run through that and I welcome any, uh, any challenge to that uh, in the questions afterwards. Um, I'd like to have a chat about some of the strategies to maximise performance of breeding programs. Uh, we'll obviously have a look at the rewards of, of being a high fertility herd, but uh, I'd like to have a bit of a look into what some of the risks are and, and how to mitigate those risks to ensure long-term profit, long profitability. So I suppose if we start with fertility, one of the things I really like talking to producers about fertility uh, is that both commercial producers and sea stock producers both face some of the same, some of the similar issues. Um, and so it's a really universal thing that we've got to manage and I think manage is the key word. So if, if we start to describe fertility, uh, I think we'd all agree that it's the ability for a cow to become pregnant, but uh, I, don't think that's, I don't think that's all the story. Uh, calf unassisted, that would certainly be nice. Uh, and raise a calf to weaning is, uh, is also uh, a little bit essential. But the reality is that it's, it's the ability for a female to do all of the above, doing it early in the calving period, on an annual basis starting as a two-year-old heifer. And uh, I think a lot of the conversation around the, lo around the longevity and, and our ability to create, create some EBVs for that is, is uh, a very valid discussion. Um, so we, 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 we all often uh, talk about fertility being one of the key profit drivers and certainly uh, uh, that's universally accepted. But I just wanted to cover off why, why we think fertility does actually drive profit. Um, I'd argue that high fertility is not high pregnancy rates. Uh, but it's in fact the conception pattern. So it's, it's about having a, a large number of calves born unassisted early in the calving period. And, and why does this drive profit? Mostly it comes through an increase in average age and therefore weight of the calves. So over 400, between zero and 400 days, these calves are typically doing close to a, a kilo a day. So if, if a calf is a day older, it's generally going to be a kilo heavier. So at a very base level, we can start to understand that there's a few dollars of, of value in, in simply having those calves older. Um, there's, but I, I think it's more than that. One of the first things we've got to decide when we set up a breeding program is, is when we're going to carve. And we try to align, we try to align our time of calving so that our peak animal requirements are in line with our peak pasture production. And so 
what happens is the more calves we can have born in that period of, of peak growth, the more growth they can capture before that feed quality falls away. So I don't think it's even as easy as saying, you know, if, if there's a calf a month later, that that calf's going to be 30, 30 days and 30 kilos lighter. That gap becomes bigger because those calves that are on spring for longer, their growth rate actually speeds up in effect. It becomes more exponential. So I, I think it's, it's, it's more than just the age. Uh, the other thing is, is an increase in ongoing performance of females and reduced dystochia. So we know that those calves that are born earlier are going to be heavier heifers come breeding. They're going to join earlier, have higher body weights, which makes them a much easier pregnancy to manage, uh, and then they're going to have lower dystochia rates when we get to calving. Um, but most importantly, I'd like to point out that fertility has a very low heritability. So it really is about management and placing selection pressure on, on reproductive outcomes. It's not something that we can... It's not something we can buy or, or do easily. So I've just got a bit of an example here, and, and often it's hard to, hard to get people involved, but uh, I'll, I'll give you a trick. Um, we're going to look at two herds. Uh, let's assume that the genetics in the two heads are the same. Uh, they're on the same property, but they're just managed. We've got, we've got two, two managers in the property, and they're managing them differently. But we've got to buy one of these herds of 100 animals. So um, I'll give you the pregnancy rates for these two herds. Can I get a raise of hands? I'm going to give you three options for herd A, herd B, or you'd like to know some more information. So have we got anyone that's, that's happy to jump in and buy herd A? I sort of gave the answer away a bit, didn't I? Anybody on herd B? Or who'd like to know a little bit more about these herds? Yep. Oh, very kind of you. That's good. Um, so if I suggested that herd A had a 10-week joining, but herd B had a 6-week joining, is anyone wanting to swing for herd A? Herd B? or are we still keen to know even a little bit more information? So wh what I'd like to suggest is that herd A has got 40% of calves born in the first three weeks. So we know that they've got the higher preg rate, uh, we know that they're a long joining, but we don't actually know where within that 10 week joining the calves reside. But we've got some data here to suggest that that's 40% the first three weeks. If we have a look at herd B, although they're a lower, for, lower pregnancy rate herd, we can see that they've got 70% of their calves conceiving in the first three weeks to calve. Now, I think we can start to appreciate that, that the density of the calving in herd B is going to be a lot faster than it is in herd A, and those calves therefore are going to have a, a greater potential to, to harvest grass at a time when it's, high, when it's at its highest quality. So I would suggest that this is a low fertility herd and this is a high fertility herd. And I think we can see that, that obviously that pregnancy rate didn't give us much information to make that decision. But if we have a look at this a slightly different way, so this is our low fertility herd. It's our 98% preg rate with a 10-week calving. We can see that there's 40% in the first cycle and then it tapers away after that. If we compare that to our other herd, high fertility herd, we've got a 90% preg rate with a six-week calving and we can see that there's 70% in that first cycle. Now, I think we can start to appreciate that that there is certainly a cluster towards the front end of that calving. But when, we'd like, when we compare our performance across seasons, when we go down to the pub and we talk about how things went this year, we, we like to use numbers that are simple. Uh, and so pregnancy rate has, has always been the number that we've, we've gone to. And, and if we went down there and we started talking in conception patterns and said, oh, I've got a 70-20 or I've got a 30 40, 30, 25, 5, it, it doesn't make much sense. So we wanted to find a way that we could in effect, uh, analyse a calving period <coughs> and, and determine how fertile it was. So I've just graphed these exact same joinings a slightly different way. What we've got on the, uh, on the y-axis here is the percentage of empty cows, and across the bottom on the x-axis we've got the days of the joining period. So you can see that, that as the joining period progresses, the pregnancy, well sorry, the, the percentage of empty cows is reducing, they're becoming pregnant. Another way to put that is that the area underneath that line is in effect missing reproductive efficiency. So we can see that the difference between the red line, which is our 10-week low fertility herd, and the blue line, which is our six-week high fertility herd, that the difference in there is, is basically lost reproductive efficiency or lost performance. But, but how can we compare these two things really easily? And what we've come up with is what we call an average calving date. So, it's a product of, of two major factors. One is the length of the joining period, but the second is how many animals are born in the first cycle of that joining period. So it, it gives us a number that, that we can compare, but it also gives us a number where we can do some economic analysis and compare joining periods. So I'd suggest that we, we can calculate the average calving date of, 
of the six week joining to be day 16 and the average calving date of the 10 week joining to be day 30. So all of a sudden we can start to see that on average every calf in that six week joining is actually going to be 14 days older and have 14 days more opportunity to gain weight. Uh, and the difference in that in a dollar term is about $70 a calf which, which is significant. So that was the same 100 cows managed two different ways and we, we're generating a $70 differential between the calves based mostly on the weight they, they can uh, capture. So if we just go through w how we came up with that number in effect, how we price what, an, what one day of, of uh, calf age is worth, we've got the increased average age and weight which we've talked about, we've got the improved rebreeding of the cow and subsequent calves. So the earlier that cow calves and the closer that cow is calving to when she can capture high quality pasture herself, she'll be able to rebreed better. Uh, and if she does that, it, you can see that it becomes a bit of a perpetual benefit in that she continually calves early and she continually has calves that then grow better and can rejoin er, and can join earlier. Uh, we have some improve, improved management efficiencies, obviously monitoring calvings. We've got a shorter calving period to monitor. We've got calf marking, weaning, things like marketing that can be done more efficiently because we can do them quicker and together. Uh, we've got reduced disease, so certainly dystochia is reduced because we've got these animals, we can grow them better because we're closer, closer to that pasture gro growth curve. Um, reduced calf deaths because we know we get a lot of these diseases in things like calf diarrhoea, we're, we're getting more scours develop later in adjoining because of contamination of pastures. So there's, there's a few different benefits here. Um, there's a lower cost weaning, certainly in the herds that we see with really short fertility, uh, sorry, short calving periods, there's fewer there's a smaller tail to the mob, so there's fewer light calves that need to be, need to be pushed along. Sale groups are even, so that sort of ties into the marketing. Uh, and certainly I've, I've mentioned the better heifer breeding, so we get a better enrolment of heifers and then they're able to breed better in subsequent years. <coughs> so we've, we've valued that at, at, at depending on the, depending basically on the price of, of a kilo of body weight, that varies from four to seven dollars per calf per day. Um, so if we work on five dollars, that means that every cycle has about $100 difference in value of the calf. So if you've got, you know, a calf that's born in the second cycle is going to be $100 lower in value than a calf born in the first cycle. So uh, that's, a, that's a significant influence on, on the income generated from these animals. Um, I suppose to cover off here, some of the other comments we get from people is that uh, certainly they believe the difference between calves from their heifers and their cows is, is reduced and that's often been a bit of an issue for for commercial guys wanting to retain heaps of heifers, but it is very hard to drive fertility without a lot of heifers coming into the system and understanding that there's some benefits to having those heifers come in. And one of those is that we shouldn't have a phobia of retaining lots of heifers when we get to join them all. And I've got, some, I've got a graph in a minute to show you this, but we can join lots of heifers, select out the pregnancies we want, and those heifers in the meantime have been sitting on very low cost spring pasture and we're able to sell them at heavier, heavier weights. So there's some advantages, whether that's a PTIC sale, whether that's an empty heifer into feedlot, what, whatever it is, uh, we shouldn't be afraid to be retaining heaps of heifers. Um, uh, and, and I suppose the, the, the closing comment on the benefits is that starting females as early calvers is the biggest step to managing an early calving herd. If we, if we let those animals calve down as later calvers, I'm sure everybody in the room has had some experience where moving a calving forward, uh, or sorry, I should say back, bringing animals calving earlier uh, is, is very difficult to do. Um, this is just a, look, another graph to put some figures on it. We can see here I've got a, uh, I can't quite point out it, but there's a, starting from the, uh, it'll be the left of the screen, is a six week, six week um, carving, then an eight week carving, a nine week carving, and a 12 week carving. And you can, you can see that you've got this cluster of calves born early in that period, which, which we've, we've just spoken about. Um, often the argument comes up, well, I might have a 12 week joining, but why can't I have the conception rate of a six week joining in the first cycle? And I would argue there that it's a reasonable question, but I don't believe I've ever been able to see evidence of it happen because what happens is that an animal that calves late has a younger heifer. That heifer actually struggles to grow in line with its contemporaries anyway. And when we get to joining, that animal's going to join up later. So animals, if, if we give them a longer calving spread, they will spread out over that and we will struggle to get heifers into a, into a tighter period in the future. So um, we, if we want a short calving, we have to manage for a short calving. But as far as the benefits, there's... 
if, if we went from there, you'll see the bottom, the table at the bottom there in the, um, in the fourth row down, we've got the dollar value. So to move from a 12 week carving back to a nine week carving has about a $40 benefit per, per calf and that's on every calf in the group. Um, to go back to an eight week is, is a $65 benefit and that's compared to the 12 week carving. Uh, and certainly to get back to a six week carving from a, from a 12 week is, is an $85 benefit. So there's, there's some significant gains to be made there. Um, how do we improve fertility? I think it's, it's important to understand and work towards breeding targets. So identifying what it is we're trying to achieve and then seeing whether we achieve it's really important. Understanding and managing the conception pattern. That's a huge one and we've spoke, spoken about that. Um, but I think the biggest thing here is that we've just got to understand that we have to manage it. And, and it's a really nice thing to know that something that drives our profit as strongly as fertility is something that we actually have a heavy influence on. I think that's a really, really positive thing to take away from it. So heritability, I mean, at the moment, we're, we're basically dealing with days to calving being our best, best fertility EBV. And, and we've got to understand that's got a heritability of 7% versus something like uh, IMF, which has got 32%. So understanding that huge amount of what actually happens in fertility outcomes is, is based on, on the environment, which hopefully we can manage. Um, and uh, if we have a look at what influences fertility, we've, we've got management of females, management of bulls, management or prevention of diseases, and then, then ultimately management of the pregnancies. And I think the common word there, if I haven't said enough, is management. Um, so if we ha have, have a look here, just delving a little bit deeper into each of those, those topics. Obviously with females, we've got the issue of heifer retention. Uh, development and then dystochia management. So how many are we going to retain? How are we going to grow them? We've got time and length of the calving period and I think this is really important. A lot of the herds that we find uh, struggling uh, are often calving at a time that's sub-ideal but they haven't, unless we compare how they go in previous years and, and I admit that seasons do change a little bit year to year but the time of when we carve is really important if, if we intend to be driving uh, certainly driving high stocking rates and maintaining our fertility. Body condition at calving is, is a really essential one. I'll talk a bit about that. Feed available post-calving, those two will contribute to what, the, what we call the postpartum interval or, or the period post-calving until an animal uh, female starts to cycle again. So what we know is that if animals are in light body condition, we're going to need to provide them more feed post-calving uh, to reduce that postpartum interval. And then we've got time of weaning, which time of weaning feeds back into body condition. Uh, at calving pretty heavily. That's, that's our main tool to make sure that's right. If we look at the bulls, we've got pre-existing bull issues and, and ruling those out so they don't create any sub-fertility. And then we've got bull failures that occur during the joining period. Um, and look, bulls are certainly a, a topic on their own, but, but they're a couple of the key things that'll contribute to fertility. Then we've got disease prevention, and I'll, I'll touch off on that, but there's a couple of main ones we want to cover. Um, to put it into perspective, I, I, I thought I'd just put the cycle of a cow up there, and, and I know uh, uh, none of this is new to anybody here, but we've got to understand that a cow's pregnant for 280 days. We've then got this postpartum interval between when they calve and when they're going to start cycling, and we've got to understand that that's a fixed period. Every cow is going to have a period in there. Now, it, it's, going to, it's going to change depending on the age of the cow, the body condition when they calved, and the feed that we offer them. But Understanding that there's a period there where they can't breed means we really only have, on average, if we worked on 50 days, which is, which is pretty average, um, and it can be a lot worse than that, we only have 35 days to rejoin that animal so that they carve on the same date the following year. So we've got to get all these things, all those items in the list right to make sure that, that she's capable of doing that. Um, to elaborate on the managing pregnancies, what I mean by that is the joining periods don't have to equal calving periods. I think it's a really important point. It's, it's a little underutilised. By If we're able to measure our conception pattern and understand where the pregnancies are, we can know how to select for the ones we need and, and how to manage them. So uh, making use of early age pregnancy diagnosis I think is really important. Um, and if, if, if you've either missed that opportunity to do that or you or you don't have that available to you, uh, which, which it is there, there is, there's lots of services offering that, then having a look at the calving, as you go through calving, having a look at the number of animals calved by the end of each cycle will at least give you an appreciation for, for what the fertility of your herd is at present, and, and that can obviously give you some confidence to, to make changes in the future. So um, I suppose my, my biggest comment there is that I, I, we truly believe profitability is driven by when the cows are pregnant, not if they are. So you've got to be very careful what we what we use as our, as our uh, measure of success. Um, 
This is just a quick example. I've got a high fertility carving here, and for the purpose of the exercise, I've, I've assumed that these two joinings are basically the same fertility. So we've got a 70% first cycle conception rate in both groups, but in one group, the bulls were left in for six weeks only. In the other group, uh, the bulls were left in for eight weeks. Now, if we have a look at the average calving date of these two dates, that would actually push that from about day 16 now to about day 18. So that would mean that, that just by doing that, we dropped the value of all those calves by almost, uh, almost $10, which, which is quite incredible. But understanding that, that we don't actually need 95% of these animals pregnant to have an adequate replacement number. I mean, once we set up a farm, we should have a number of breeding animals that we're targeting each year. And, and uh, as I get around to do preg testing, the, the, my favourite jobs are where I turn up and they, they often suggest, oh, look, look, doc, it doesn't matter. Today we only need about 75%. And uh, that's a co stark contrast to other properties where we go and, and they're pretty edgy unless we're getting towards 98% preg rate. But it shows to me, I suppose, that there's an understanding that, that we're really targeting the early carvers and we understand what drives profit. So uh, if we collect the pregnancy data and if we chop that out, um, there's, some, there's some benefit. And in this case, it would be, uh, as I said, close to that $10 per calf. So it'd be, be almost $900 for, for a mob of 100 calves. But they're the same joining and all we did was identify those pregnancies and then, and then remove them once we, we figured out how we were tracking on our total numbers. Um, just to cover on the, the risks bit of, of high fertility, I suppose I, I, I wanted to summarise some of the data we've got from, from sub-fertility or infertility investigations that we do. And the main things that we, we see come undone in short joinings are, uh, are bull injuries, probably virgin bulls, use of virgin bulls, um, female postpartum intervals and nutrition. So We've got to understand that if we only allocate these animals a short joining period and things don't go perfectly well, there's not much room for, move, room for movement. So um, the other things would be reproductive diseases and, and certainly heifer preparation. So for instance, if we've got heifers that are a little off the boil, uh, they haven't, haven't reached a, a very high cyclicity rate by the time the bulls go in and we only offer those animals four or six weeks, uh, a lot of those heifers are actually going to start cycling at the time we take the bull out. Now, Clearly we just should have managed the heifers better and had them ready to go, but what I'm suggesting is that the shorter that joining is, the higher the risk of these things bringing us undone. And certainly in, in, in previous times, longer joinings would actually see a lot of those issues happen and then recover. And, and what we would see is a pregnancy rate that was fine, however a fertility that was significantly retarded in effect because conception pattern would be pushed towards later in the joining. And if you looked at pregnancy rate alone, it didn't tell the story. But if you looked at your average calving date or you mapped the conceptions, you, you would see it. Um, and, and look, simply, all, all I think this means, all I'm trying to say here is that understanding that that shorter joining is a higher risk uh, and understanding that to, to maintain our income, we've basically got to set up a uh, prevention strategy. Um, so why do joinings fail? Uh, we've got female factors, body condition score at calving, Days post-carving and feed post-carving, they obviously all, all interrelate to make sure that females are actually ready for joining. We've got bulls. We've spoken about the existing issues in bulls and then issues that develop within the joining period, and, and that's a big one. We've got to understand that no matter how well we assess a bull before we put them out to joining, they can injure themselves very quickly. So, so observation of bulls is really important. The other comment on bulls would be, would be inadequate joining ratios following artificial breeding programs. So I think this is a really big one. A lot of commercial producers will get into artificial breeding with the perspective of reducing their bull requirement. And our opinion is, is that your bull requirement is in effect the same. We've got to understand that the females that are not pregnant, although as soon as we've done the AI, we could have 45 to 70 per cent, if we're 60 per cent pregnant to the AI uh, and only 40 per cent not pregnant, we've got to understand they're going to come in over a, over a three to seven day period. So the work rate for a bull per 30 after an AI program is, is higher than a work rate of a bull per 60 in a normal joining. So it doesn't reduce the bull requirement. Um, and then the disease list again, which, which we'll cover. But there is no irony that the reasons joinings fail is the same list as the things we can manage. So I, I think we've, we've well and truly got control of these things. If we, we just look uh, into some, some aspects of how we mitigate this risk, I always think that risk mitigation starts with identifying sources of risk and then strategically preventing them. So I see a lot of prevention strategies that, that are a little uh, 
little sort of stab in the dark style and, and we'd like to identify where are we seeing failures and what's the most cost effective way to prevent those failures. So um, certainly a lot of these things will correlate with, with items of what we could manage. Uh, targeting specific carving times and length of joining for the environment. So important to understand what your environment's capable of and, and uh, when we see people move between districts we, we often see some issues as they get used to what, what they should be doing. So seeking professionals in, in new environments to understand what you should be doing and, and setting up targets for how you should be performing is really important. Um, ensuring adequate female replacement numbers are coming through, retaining 90% of heifers and letting fertility or the bull be the first selection tool I think is probably the most important step. If, if you took nothing else away from my talk today except for the fact that retaining basically all the heifers and letting the bull be the first selection tool, um, then, then I truly believe your businesses will be more profitable because those animals, we, we can apply whatever selection pressure we like once we've, once we've let fertility take effect. But if we go in there and pre-select out too many of those heifers, we will retard fertility. And we know that fertility has a huge potential to influ influence our profitability. So we have to be careful, and I've got a bit of a, picture, a, a graph to show, but we have to be careful that, that prior selection of heifers doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't force us into longer calving periods. Um, ensuring replacement heifers are, are reaching critical mating weights as a minimum. Um, obviously there's a number, there's a bit of research going on at the moment to see whether that is exactly where it should be, but, but that's the current recommendation. Um, uh, ensuring body condition targets are met. So if we look at spring carvers, we know that spring carvers go onto a better flush of feed uh, as, as soon as they carve. So we can afford for them to be in a two and a half out of five body condition score. Autumn carvers, unfortunately, uh, carve in the autumn. They might, they might get access to a little bit of good feed, but then they go into winter and that feed quality reduces significantly. So they really need to be a, a whole condition score heavier. Um, uh, and then ensuring postpartum intervals. So if we have a look at the table I've got here, um, you'll see across the top row in bold there is body condition score of the cows at calving. So we've got a range of one and a half to two, two and a half to three, and then three and a half to four. Um, down the left we've got high feed versus low feed. Um, and we've got, in that top column, we've got days to return to cycling. So what I want to show you here is that a cow in body condition score three and a half to four that's on a high plane of nutrition could potentially be recycling after about 31 days. But if we swing to the other corner, we look at a cow that's in two score at calving with low feed on offer, that, that um, postpartum interval is probably going to be 65 days. So I've worked on 50 with some of my maths, but it's important to understand that it's not hard for that number to get to 60 to 70 days. Um, and, and understanding that first carvers are even, uh, are certainly even longer than this because they've got a bit more to do. So if we look at a postpartum interval, we recommend 40 days until cedar insertion, which would be 50 days to AI and mature cows. First carvers need an additional 10 days or a half score of body condition. So that, that's important to understand. Um, and it's important to make sure that first carvers are fed better uh, during, during uh, the lead up to joining. If we have a quick look at bulls, um, I've got to get a bit of a wriggle on, but if we have a quick look at bulls, um, it's important to remove sub-infertile bulls before the joining, so ensuring that we source bull introductions from reputable studs and inquirers to their disease protocols to make sure we've got them up to speed. We complete an annual bull breeding evaluation of the bulls, we remove the infertile bulls, but potentially more importantly we identify and manage our high-risk bulls. So this would involve all of our virginal first season bulls but also any bulls that might have niggling injuries or, or lower libido. We want to identify those bulls. We want to multi-side join them in conjunction with higher fertility bulls, uh, allocate them a reduced mating potential and make sure we have them closer to where we can observe them, uh, closer paddocks and, and, and closer observation. Um, uh, we need to make sure that we monitor bulls during the joining to minimise the negative effects of any issues that can develop. So observing these bulls, training our staff, again making sure we multi-side join or, or rotate any single size and uh, mixing age groups or high and low risk bulls. We, we don't want to rely on any of those high risk bulls. Um, the diseases, I, I won't go into that uh, in too much detail, but the three main diseases are vibriosis, pestivirus and lepto. Um, and they're very easily preventable by, by vaccination. Certainly with Vibrio, it's important not to share bulls. Uh, and then there's, there's some good, it's important to understand your immunity status with Pestivirus, but there's some good vaccination programs available for that and Lepto. And then understanding uh, the issue of penile injuries in, in new bulls. We, we've got to understand that virgin bulls work 
uh, with an extra dose of, of uh, enthusiasm when they first go out and typically a bull when they go to a new population of females will come in contact with pathogens that are, that are uh, I'm not saying they're infected herds but they're novel to, to what that to the, uh, the parent herd of the bull. So if they do that at a time with a high workload, they, they will typically pick up a whole range of penile injuries. Um, if we can introduce and expose those bulls prior to, um, uh, prior to a high work rate period, that's important. Uh, and last one here, I just want to point out that short carvings really do not require short joining. So making use of pregnancy diagnosis and, and collecting that data in a way you can analyse and actually use it to drafts, really important. Um, but from the results you've jo you're joining, you should select for profitable carving. Um, we'll, we'll s I'll sort of skip this one, but that's actually just a normal natural service joining of some heifers. And what I wanted to identify is that if we select out 60% of those heifers and we have the intention to turn over 25% of our females, which is, which is basically average, we would need 90% of them pregnant. So that would give us a 60 day joining. If we instead join 90% of the heifers and, jo and only need 60% to get the same number, that would be a 30 day joining with an average calving date of day 14. Um, and that's a $45 advantage. So that's the same group of heifers. We get to sell the heavy portion off but understanding that, that we could actually join them for that whole period and simply keep those earlier ones by getting our preg data. So um, in summary, please understand fertility really should be average calving dates, not pregnancy rates, and, and it is up to our management to do it. For profitability is driven by when cows are pregnant, not if they are. Uh, beef fertility starts with heifer management, so retaining 90% and letting fertility be the first selection tool is, is the most important way to make sure we've got enough females coming into the system to be pushing out lower fertility cows. Uh, aiming for short calving periods and understanding we've got heaps of tools to help us achieve that. Um, and understand that, that with high performance is high risk, so we've, we've got to manage that appropriately. Um, we'll stop there. Thanks Shane, uh, great insights there into managing fertility, that's for sure. Uh, is there any questions before we break for morning tea? Sam White. Uh, thanks very much Christian. Uh, Shane, thanks for a great presentation, well done mate. Um, just uh, uh, two questions, um, while we use the Vibrio backs in our bulls, is there a benefit of Vibrioing heifers in prepping heifers for joining or is it a waste of money? Yeah, look, good, good question. Um, the, the answer to that question is that the Vibrio vaccine is extremely effective at preventing infection in bulls. So the, there's, there's a bit of data out there about its use in females, and that's only really required in control of a, of a confirmed outbreak. One of the issues we've got with Vibrio is the accuracy of the tests we use to diagnose it. So we, we have to be careful on our recommendations of that, but that, that's sort of a, that's a different topic. The, the answer to your question is that no, you do not need to vaccinate females to prevent vibriosis. You need to vaccinate the bulls. But if you're dealing with an outbreak and trying to get it under control, then, then it would be a component in the short term, as well as having clean and, and dirty bull herds. But, but as a prevention strategy, bulls only. Yep, thank you. My second question was, um, is in terms of prepping, prepping the heifers, um, can they be too fat or is the growth rate prior to joining, can that have an impact on the fertility of that animal? You've got me about a fortnight early. Um, there's some data to come out of uh, uh, Gabriel Bay from Argentina where they're breeding heifers in feedlots and, and certainly uh, uh, the Trans-Tasman project as well should, should shed some light on this. It, um, I'd be better off not commenting, Sam, in that it's, it's anecdotal, but the, the answer to it is that there's heaps of advantages of having really well-grown heifers, and there's some suspicions out there that, that heifers that are overweight are potentially having some metabolic issues with high circulating glucose levels, and it's yet to be confirmed, so I, I should probably stop at that, but I think, um, watch this space a little bit, we, we often, Whenever we run artificial breeding programs, there's heaps of other factors that, that get in the road and, and can complicate it, whether that be multiple size used in AI or, or what it is. But uh, uh, anecdotally, we, we pre-test a lot of joinings and some of the best prepared heifers as far as body weight and growth rate leading up to joining uh, can struggle to breed at times, but uh, yeah, work to come. Okay, any other last questions before we, uh, we break? All right, everyone's ready for your... Yeah, oh, yeah, Lockie, one more. Get to get wait for the mic, mate. Wait for the mic, yeah. Sorry, um, great talk, Shane. Lockie Wilson from Murder Duke. Just um, 
touch on the value of synchronisation and the potential. I reckon it's a good way to change or shorten the carving intervals and things. Yeah, absolutely. Look, uh, Christian was winking at me, so I, I didn't want to elaborate what I was talking about the heifers, but uh, I think um, w joining a heap of heifers is the first step, uh, but certainly synchronising. When people look to use commercial artificial breeding programs or commercial AI in heifers, um, they, they do it for a couple of reasons, but the biggest reason by far is, is fertility. So there's some huge advantages in, in condensing the number of calves at the start of the joining. And we've got a lot of commercial producers now that join enough heifers that they, they'll do an AI, put the bulls out, and there's actually enough heifers generated by the AI that that's all they have. And there's some real efficiencies by having a whole heifer drop drop on, you know, in effect one day of conception, but they're going to carve over a couple of, over a fortnight or so. Um, uh, the, the advantage in fertility is is extreme and it just depends, I suppose, to, to comment on, you know, the, for instance, if you kept just the AIs and compared that to a six week joining, you're moving your average calving date in effect from day 16 back to day one at $5 a day. So there's, there's, a, uh, there's an $80 benefit in, in, in that. Um, uh, but it depends how long a journey you keep after. But uh, th there's huge room to, huge room for uh, profitable um, decisions with commercial producers making use of AI. There's no doubt.